All right, class. So today we are going to try and finish chapter three. And so the place that we left off actually was talking about enzymes. And so we start by looking at what actually is an enzyme and what are some of their functions. Well, one of the major functions of enzymes, and we kind of touched on this before, is really to kind of accelerate certain metabolic activities or metabolic equations. And that's what we see here uh, up top is that enzymes are catalysts that accelerate normal physiologic activities. By doing this, or the way they do this, is by decreasing the activation energy of the cellular reactions. So we're basically trying to decrease the amount of energy required in order to send a reaction, uh, in this case, towards the right. In the case of an uncatalyzed reaction, it's basically where we have no enzyme present during the reaction. And a catalyzed reaction is where the enzyme is present. Um, it's only going to facilitate reactions that would already occur. And again, we're trying to push things uh, toward the way of uh, the reactants moving towards the products. And so because of this, it actually increases the rate of product formation. And so a few things, a few additional things that we have to kind of take a look at is the reaction rate. And so when we look at the reaction rate, it's a measure of how quickly a chemical reaction actually takes place. Now we said the enzymes actually lower activation energy, but in order to understand that we need to understand what activation energy is. And activation energy is the energy required to break existing chemical bonds. And this energy required is the primary factor in determining the reaction rate. And so by utilizing an enzyme, we're actually able to overcome uh, the energy, the activation energy requirement. And so when we look at in a lab, uh, we can increase uh, temperature and by increasing temperature, it provides additional energy in order to break bonds. And so if you've taken any chemistry, you'll know that in order to speed up reactions, oftentimes we add heat and we heat up the, uh, the system. A significant temperature increase in a cell would actually denature the proteins or can actually break them down. And so protein catalysts called enzymes then are used instead. Now, one of the things we have to look at are the types of reactions that are actually involved. So again, this is all activation energy based. So when we look at an exergonic reaction, uh, you'll see here at the point, let me go ahead and change that. We'll see here uh, that this is kind of the point where we start. This is kind of the base level. Uh, this is the reactant, so this is sucrose. This is the normal amount of energy here on the red line. Uh, the normal activation energy required without an enzyme. Now, when we utilize an enzyme, you'll notice here in blue or purple that we actually lowered the amount of activation energy required. And so by doing this, we can have a certain amount of energy in the system. And by having an enzyme, that same amount of energy is actually going to allow us to send this reaction from reactants to products at a much uh, more usable rate. So we get a chance to utilize the energy for more reactions by utilizing an enzyme. So again, when we look at this, sucrose has a higher potential energy than the total potential energy of the products and the activation energy required to initiate the reaction uh, is what we have. Uh, again, if we utilize uh, the enzyme, it's actually going to lower the required activation energy. So again, we get a chance to kind of see this. I blew the, uh, the graph or the table up here. So you get a chance to kind of see it a little bit larger if it wasn't very big on the previous slide. So as we start to look at the structure then of enzymes, um, again, we've talked about some globular proteins. We've talked about fibrous proteins, uh, but globular proteins tend to be more enzyme in nature. They're going to range in size from small uh, proteins to large proteins. 
meaning sm small meaning that we only have roughly roughly 60 amino acids involved, or we can have upwards of 2,500 amino acids. Uh, most enzymes are going to have a very uh, unique three-dimensional structure in the protein chain called an active site. And this active site is where we actually bind what we are going to eventually call our substrate. So the substrate comes in, binds to the enzyme, and when that occurs, we then have what we call a enzyme substrate complex. So here's what we're looking at when we look at this enzyme. You can see here all, all these little uh, blue bubbles. Those represent different types of amino acids in this particular chain. Again, you can see here this empty space. This is the active site. And then we have a substrate. Now understand that the substrate is, or I should say, the active site is going to have a lot of specificity. So it's going to be very specific with what it actually allows into the active site. So it's only going to permit a single specific substrate to bind into it. And then you'll notice as the substrate comes in, we have a little bit of a shape change around the active site of that particular enzyme. And when we do this and the substrate binds to that active site, we now have this enzyme substrate complex. And this now helps catalyze only one specific region uh, or one specific reaction, I should say. Uh, and so we'll actually see uh, different types of uh, enzymes have the ability to react or cause a reaction on, again, specific substrates. And oftentimes when we look at the naming of our enzymes, we'll notice that most of them uh, end in ASE, uh, three letters ASE again, ACE. And as we see that, you'll notice that when we name the reactions, they're going to be very specific reactions. So what are some of the locations of our enzymes? Well, some of them are going to remain within the cells. So for example, DNA polymerase. DNA polymerase is going to help form the new DNA molecules when we get to DNA replication. Some enzymes are going to become embedded in the plasma membrane. And so we'll see, for example, lactase uh, in the walls of the small intestines. And as we see this again, looking at the, the name of the enzyme, there's the ASE uh, in it. It's going to help digest uh, lactose. And then we also have some enzymes that are actually secreted from the cell. So for example, our pancreatic amylase is released from the pancreas and it helps to participate in starch digestion. So when we look at the mechanism of the enzyme and we look at enzyme you know, catalysis, this is, these are kind of the steps that actually occur. Uh, I'm going to take a step back here. Basically take the steps that occur on this particular uh, enzyme or this particular type of reaction. So we'll see that the substrate is going to enter that active site, again, forming that enzyme substrate complex. Uh, again, if we go back to that graphic or that image, you'll notice that that enzyme did change shape as it kind of surrounded uh, the substrate and it results in an even closer fit. Okay. Now, as we go through the reaction then the enzyme is actually going to change shape or that chain, that shape change actually stresses the chemical bonds and it can cause new bonds to be formed. And then once this occurs, the products are released and the enzyme can actually go back and repeat the process somewhere else. So when we look at this example, again, this is our enzyme lactase. And here is the uh, substrate lactose. Again, very specific in how or what can fit in there. So here comes our substrate, it binds to it. We now have this enzyme substrate complex. The enzyme now has changed the shape. And in this case, you'll notice that here we have the indent. Here it kind of bulges out. So that's representing our shape change. In this case, we take lactose and now we're actually breaking the bonds uh, between the two. And then forming bonds as we add, essentially add water to that particular system. So then from here, we release those two products. So now we have glucose and galactose. Uh, they are released and the enzyme is now free to bind to other substrates. As you'll notice, the enzyme reverted back to 
its original confirmation all the way over here on the left. So again, this is a really good graphic that kind of uh, depicts the action or the mechanism of action uh, for a particular enzyme. And in this case, it's a decomposition reaction. So now we have the mechanism of an enzyme um, in a synthesis reaction. So here we have glucose monomers. And again, we're, our end product is going to be glycogen, which we've talked about being a storage vessel for glucose molecules. And so here we take glucose. We got two binding sites for them. And so the glucose binds to it. That forms our enzyme, enzyme substrate complex. And now we'll notice that we have this kind of fit for both of them. We now form the bond. Okay, so this is a uh, essentially a dehydration reaction where we're pulling water out of it. And so we're left with the product of glycogen. And again, that enzyme reverts back to its original conformation and we move it all the way back over to the left. So how do we classify and name the enzymes? Well, I kind of touched on this once a little bit already, uh, looking at this suffix component here. But the enzymes are named based on the name of the substrate or the product. And we have numerous different subclasses of these particular enzymes. And again, if we look at the suffix, we're actually going to see the suffix being ASE. So here's a few examples. Pyruvate dehydrogenase. And it's going to transfer hydrogen from pyruvate. DNA polymerase. It's going to add our uh, nucleotides or our base pairs uh, onto the DNA molecule. And then lactase is an example of an enzyme that's going to digest lactose. Um, we also can classify them based on the rate of a chemical reaction and how we look at these reactions being accelerated. So as we look at these enzymes, they can actually accelerate the reaction by the increase in the enzyme concentration. So as we increase or add more enzymes to it, we're also accelerating that reaction quite substantially. We can also increase the substrate concentration. Uh, and so as we add more substrate, that means the enzymes can actually create more reactions. However, there is a point of saturation where the enzymes can only go through so many reactions before we need to have time to convert it uh, back to its original conformation. So, there is a saturation point. And again, that's what saturation is. So much substrate is present that all enzyme molecules are engaged in the creation or in the process of the reaction. And then our third way that we can accelerate a chemical reaction uh, is by increasing the temperature. So when we look at these three components, we add more enzymes, we increase the substrate concentration, or we increase temperature are all ways that we can actually accelerate uh, a particular reaction. And so this is what we're looking at when we look at enzyme saturation. Again, we have the enzymes, we have our substrates where the substrates can bind to it. But again, each enzyme can only hold uh, so much of the substrate before it, it can't hold anything else. So basically, once you fill that active site with a, or with a reactant, you essentially filled that particular enzyme. And when we have only so many enzymes in the system, they can only go through so many reactions. And that's where we hit that point of enzyme saturation. So what's the effect of temperature? Well, the three-dimensional shape of enzymes is actually dependent on temperature. Remember, enzymes are a type of protein, and proteins are broken down when temperatures get too uh, out of the norm. So human enzymes function best at a, an optimal body temperature. Now, we've historically known that body temperature to be 98.6. Um, just kind of a little side note, I, this hasn't necessarily been confirmed, but I do believe there's been some reports that the average body temperature is actually starting to decrease slightly. Um, when we look at the temperature beginning to increase, this actually gives us a little bit more of a moderate fever. 
And as we start to see that temperature increase, it's actually going to result in more efficient enzyme activity temporarily. Okay, so again, we're only getting slightly outside of that normal body temperature, that optimal body temperature. But now if that fever or the body temperature continues to increase, now we start to see where uh, the proteins are actually starting to break down or denature. And when this occurs, we actually start to see a loss of function with those particular enzymes. So here's what we see with the effective temperature on enzymes. We obviously get to a point where we get the optimal temperature. This is normal body temperature. As we have a little bit of a fever, you can see that there's really not a whole lot of change in activity. Uh, but once we get too far outside of that, you'll notice that the enzyme activity just completely falls off the ledge. And so it essentially tanks. As you'll notice, here is an example of a regular protein or an enzyme. And you'll notice here we have the hydrogen bonds that hold its shape or its 3D shape intact. However, too high of a temperature causes these intramolecular bonds, these hydrogen bonds, to break. And as that occurs then, you now lose that 3D structure of that particular protein. So we also have a normal body pH, okay? And so enzymes are also gonna function at a best optimal pH within our bodies. Uh, and that pH is typically gonna be, be between six and eight for most enzymes. Now, obviously, different parts of the body are going to have better functions with different pHs, but as far as uh, most uh, body tissues, it's going to be around that 6 to 8 for most enzymes. You'll notice that second bullet here, the changes in the hydronium ion concentration can actually disrupt the electrostatic interactions. And again, we kind of saw the graphic before that when we have an increase uh, of hydronium atoms, again, more hydronium atoms means that our system is becoming more acidic. More hydronium ions then can actually go in and actually break some of those bonds because again, those hydrogen bonds are actually attracted to the uh, electropositivity of a hydrogen molecule on the opposite side of a molecule. Well, now we add more of these into it and now we don't need the, the positive hydrogen of the other molecule because we already have it in the solution. And so that causes some of these interactions to uh, be disrupted, I should, or the, uh, the bonds, I should say, to be disrupted. And because of this, the enzyme can now lose its shape and begin to denature itself. Uh, again, optimal pH can differ between tissues, particularly when we look in the stomach Obviously, the pH of the stomach is going to be significantly lower than what we see with normal blood. Again, we kind of saw this slide just a little bit ago, or what you saw the effect of it, but now we see the effect of what happens with pH as opposed to temperature. Here we have a more acidic uh, temperature, excuse me, a more acidic solution. Uh, here's our optimal pH right around neutral, very close to neutral. And you'll see as we become more alkaline or more basic, we also start to see some of the same things where we basically are breaking the bonds of this particular molecule. And the same thing on this side. When it is too acidic or too alkaline, the bonds of that molecule become broke or damaged, and that starts to lose the 3D conformation of that particular molecule. So how do we control enzymes? Well, there are such things as inhibitors. Inhibitors bind enzymes or bind to enzymes and prevent enzymatic activity or enzymatic catalysis. It's gonna prevent the overproduction of a product uh, and it's later released if the inhibitor allows it to function and catalysis continues. We also have where inhibitors can actually be competitive or non-competitive. So if we look at a competitive inhibitor, the competitive inhibitor actually resembles the substrate and binds to the active site of the enzyme. Okay. Again, we said this is very specific, but in some cases, if we look at this particular substrate and we look at this competitive inhibitor 
and we look at the particular edge here, notice that the edge is very, very similar in the competitive inhibitor. So the competitive inhibitor is actually able to get into a part of that active site. And so it competes for the occupation of the active site. Uh, with a greater substrate, it's less likely the competitive inhibitor will occupy the site, um, sometimes with because of the amount of it. With less substrate, uh, it's more likely the inhibitor can occupy it because there's a little bit more opportunity for those competitive inhibitors to get to available enzyme molecules. We also have to look at the non-competitive inhibitors. And the non-competitive inhibitors do not actually resemble the substrate. So if we look here, it doesn't really resembles, resemble what our substrate is. But what it does is it binds to a site other than the active site. And this other site is called an allosteric site, okay? So I'm circling the allosteric inhibitor. Here we point to the allosteric site where that allosteric inhibitor or non-competitive inhibitor comes in and binds at that location. What then occurs is that we get some sort of conformational change to this particular enzyme. And because of this, you'll notice this substrate here is the same one that we have at the competitive inhibitor. And this is what that active site is supposed to look like. Well here, when the allosteric inhibitor binds to the allosteric site, it actually causes the active site to change shape. And now, the original substrate is no longer able to fit or bind to that particular active site. And it is not influenced by the concentration of the substrate. So what are then some metabolic pathways and multi-enzyme complexes that we look at? Well, when we look at the regulation of enzymes, one of the first ones that we look at is, or excuse me, is phosphorylation. Now, phosphorylation is essentially exactly what it sounds like. It's adding a phosphate group, okay? And so it's performed by protein kinases. And what this does then is it can turn off some, turn on some enzymes and can actually turn off others. We also have dephosphorylation. And dephosphorylation obviously then is gonna be the opposite. It's going to be the removal of a phosphate group and it's performed by phosphatases. Again, it turns on some enzymes and turns off others. So now we start getting into uh, kind of, we, we kind of shift gears here a little bit. So that was all enzymes and proteins that we were kind of touching on. Well, now we start making a transition here in chapter three to what we call cellular respiration. And this is basically different ways for our bodies to create ATP, okay? And so what is cellular respiration? Well, it's an exergonic multi-step metabolic pathway in which we have organic molecules can either be oxidized or basically are oxidized and disassembled by a series of enzymes. And the potential energy then in the chemical bonds is then released and the energy is then used to make ATP. And this process is an endergonic process and oxygen is required. So let's look at glucose oxidation here for a second. So here's kind of a step-by-step -step breakdown of glucose with the release of energy. And in this case, carbon dioxide and water are formed. If we look at glucose and we remember what the glucose structure is, it's C6H12O6. And so what glucose is, is an energy rich molecule with several CC bonds, CH bonds and CO bonds, okay? So here's kind of our net chemical reaction. We're going through oxidation, so we're adding oxygen here. So we have, here's our glucose molecule. We add six oxygen or six oxygen gas molecules. And as we go through the process, then we actually convert all of this into six carbon dioxide molecules and six water molecules. Okay. So as we start to look at that, then we start to look at how we break down glucose and what it actually gets us. 
So we start to look then at the pathways for ATP production. And so when we look at producing ATP, we have to look at how energy is actually utilized and how it's broken down. And so energy from the broken bonds is used to attach different phosphate groups to a particular ADP molecule. And by adding a phosphate group to ADP, we now convert it to ATP. Now, energy can be used directly, which is really the least common uh, method. And this is what we call substrate level phosphorylation, or energy can be used indirectly. Now, this is the most common way. And we typically see where energy is first released to coenzymes, and then energy is transferred, transferred to form ATP. And this is what we typically are going to refer to as oxidative phosphorylation. So here's kind of our cellular structures that we require. And here are the processes involved in cellular respiration. So we have glycolysis. And glycolysis is the anaerobic pathway. It does not require oxygen. Here's our intermediate stage. Here's our citric acid cycle and then our electron transport system. These ones do require oxygen, okay? So this is the aerobic part of the pathway. This is the anaerobic part of the pathway. And you can see where some of these all occur. Glycolysis is going to occur in the cytosol, whereas aerobic respiration, the intermediate citric acid, intermediate stage citric acid cycle and electron transport system are all going to occur in the mitochondria. These ones are going to produce more ATP, and since they are produced in the mitochondria, the mitochondria has the name, or typically has the nickname of being the powerhouse of the cell. So let's look at the four stages of glucose oxidation. So we first have glycolysis. We said this does occur in the cytosol. I've already said it does not require oxygen. So again, this is uh, the anaerobic pathway. Okay. And then number two, three, and four, these are aerobic And so because they're aerobic, they all require oxygen. So again, you'll see down here, stages two, three, and four occur in the mitochondria and require oxygen. So our first one is glycolysis. Again, we said glycolysis does not require energy. Uh, we're gonna see that there are 10 enzymes in the cytosol that participate in glycolysis. Uh, we're going to see that glucose is broken down into two pyruvate molecules. And as we get into this, we're not necessarily going to uh, know every little detail about all these processes. But we really just kind of want to know the summary. And one of the summary involves that. And again, glucose is being broken down into two pyruvate molecules. So that's kind of one thing that we want to know. And then we also want to know this the net production of what glycolysis is gives us two ATP and two NADH molecules. So this is gonna be the, some of the takeaways from this particular process. Uh, again, we also do wanna know that the basics of it, it does not require oxygen. Again, this is anaerobic. Now, you're going to see here is a lot of stuff, a lot of molecules, and a lot of crazy names, um, particularly with the enzymes. Again, I'm, we're not going to necessarily know all the enzymes. That's not really what we're after here. We're really after kind of understanding the summary of the process, what we start with, and really what we're after and what we create. Okay, so we are going to go through it. Um, and so if we look at what happens with glucose, it splits into two molecules of glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate, which we call 3GP. ATP is invested here. You'll see that right down here. And we see that at steps one and three. And the phosphate groups are transferred to break down the products of glucose, okay? 
So we use ATP, we break out the phosphate groups, and those become transferred, okay? So then we get to step six and seven. And so with step six and seven, we have the unattached inorganic phosphate is added to the substrate and two hydrogen atoms released to NAD plus. At step seven then, inorganic phosphate is transferred to ADP to form ATP. And you can see that down here, where we now take this phosphate group, add it to ADP, and now we have ATP. When we get to step eight, nine, and 10, these are also going, or these are steps that continue to occur uh, twice in glucose oxidation. So now we take this, the molecule from step seven and we convert it to an isomer. We lose water uh, in step nine. So water is ejected. And now we take the inorganic phosphate, becomes transferred, and it now forms again ATP. So here's our water, we lose water. Here's our phosphate that gets added then to ATP. And now we are therefore then left with pyruvate here, pyruvate here, and we've given off uh, to ATP. So again, here's kind of our summary of this. So it's a metabolic process that occurs in the cytosol and again, does not require oxygen. What do we start with? We start with glucose, this six carbon molecule. Again, what are the final products? Well, we're left with pyruvate, and then we're also left with a net of two ATP molecules. We had two invested and we created four. So we start, or we end with, I should say, a net then of two ATP molecules and two NADH molecules that are formed. So again, this slide is probably the one slide that we really should uh, really take to heart in understanding the process. Right there, the summary of glycolysis. What do we start with? Where does it occur? What are some of the characteristics? And what do we get, okay? So those are the things that we wanna really pay attention to with this. So how do we regulate glycolysis? Well, we do this through negative feedback. Um, ATP also acts as an allosteric inhibitor, and it does this to turn off phosphofructokinase, or PFK. And therefore then, as ATP increases, PFK is inhibited. And so again, one of the products then of glycolysis is pyruvate. And the fate of pyruvate then actually depends on the availability of oxygen. And so if we have a sufficient amount of oxygen available, it's actually going to move into the mitochondria. If we have insufficient amount of oxygen available, it actually then gets converted to lactate. Okay. So again, we kind of want to know this little section here as far as what actually happens with oxygen. So our next phase, again, in anabolic, excuse me, uh, this was our first one of our aerobic pathway. So now we have the remaining three stages are aerobic and do require oxygen. They also occur within the mitochondria. So what is the mitochondrion structure? Well, the first thing that we look at is that it's double membrane. So we have an inner membrane that has folds that we call cristae. We then have a space that's between these areas or between the membranes. It's called the outer compartment. The innermost space of the mitochondrion is called the matrix. And this is where the multi-enzyme complex of the intermediate stage resides. Uh, we also note that the enzymes of the citric acid cycle are also going to be present in the matrix. And then we also have the molecules of the electron transport system become embedded in the cristae. And lastly, pyruvate and coenzyme A combine to form acetyl-CoA and it's catalyzed by pyruvate dehydrogenase. So if we take a look at the intermediate stage, okay, 
we'll see that again, we are now in the process of being located in the mitochondria. Now within the mitochondria, we also have our pyruvate molecule, okay? Again, we said pyruvate is combined with CoA uh, to give us acetyl-CoA. And we also are able to create NADH in this process. So this is kind of the intermediate stage again. It's very simple. Um, it's not very long, but again, take, an, take the same approach as what we did with glycolysis. What do we start with? What do we end with? We start with pyruvate and coenzyme A. We get acetyl-CoE, excuse me, acetyl-CoA and NADH, okay? So our next one then is the citric acid cycle. Now if we take a look at the citric acid cycle, you'll notice that there's a lot of stuff in here. And again, we're not gonna spend the time to go over all the absolute details of this process. We just kinda wanna see some of the basics of what actually occurs. So when we look at the citric acid cycle uh, in this kind of cyclic metabolic pathway, there are actually nine enzymes uh, in the mitochondrial matrix. What we're gonna see is that acetyl-CoA is converted to two carbon dioxide molecules. And then the, CO, the, the CoA molecule is actually then released, okay? And you'll see that here. If we start with acetyl-CoA, uh, CoA is released. We give off two carbon dioxide molecules. And then we're left with ATP, three NADH, and one FADH2, all formed during one particular cycle of the citric acid cycle, okay? So you'll notice this is a little bit more simplified. Uh, this is kind of the net chemical reactions of the citric acid cycle. This is the more detailed uh, version of the citric acid cycle. And so again, this is why we don't necessarily go into a lot of depth on this, uh, because there is a lot. Um, it involves a lot of different enzymes, different reactants, different products. And so again, we're really just kind of looking at the basics of what we start with and what we end with. And that then leads us to our last one, uh, which is the electron transport system. So we have to look at the functions of what the electro electron transport system are. One, it's really looking to transfer the electrons or transfer of electrons from NADH and FADH2. And then it also is the energy used to make an ATP. So a few of the structures that we find within the uh, electron transport system. One, it's gonna be located within the inner membrane of the mitochondria. We're also going to see some hydronium pumps, which are gonna be proteins that specifically transport hydronium ions from the matrix to the outer membrane compartment. What these pumps do though, is they help to maintain a hydronium ion gradient between the outer compartment and the mitochondrial matrix. We're also gonna see electron carriers, which are actually gonna transport the electrons between hydronium pumps. And then we see that this series of hydronium pumps and the combination of electron carriers then collectively is going to be called the electron transport chain, okay? Now again, we go over this electron transport system relatively quickly. Uh, we don't go in depth because there's a, a, a lot of other stuff involved. And it's also very detailed, um, which is a little bit um, outside of a basic A and P class for, for our purposes. Um, but as far as uh, the rest of this chapter, this is the end of chapter three. Um, understand that our exam is going to cover chapters one, two, and three. And we'll see that coming up here uh, pretty quickly. Um, and then as far as the, the attendance portion of this uh, lecture, uh, we're actually going to use exam one uh, as our attendance code word. Uh, so again, 
when we look at the code word for this particular part of chapter three, uh, the code word is going to be exam one. And that will end up being all the material for exam one. Uh, we'll go ahead and if you do have any questions, you're always more than welcome to ask. Uh, and I will have some more details on exam one uh, on Canvas.